Hey guys, welcome back for another Metallurgy Monday. We're going to be in the office here today, and today we're going to talk about grain refinement. I just want to start by saying I think there seems to be sort of a, a standard uh, bit of information when it comes to this subject in particular, and that's probably true of a lot of things. But I think that kind of comes with just repetition, like, you know, I hear you say something and you know whether i verify it or not as accurate you know i repeat that same sort of bit of information and then on down the line so i think a lot of people are kind of repeating the same sort of things when it comes to grain refinement in particular and i would kind of sum it up in a few sentences when in when it comes to this subject you know you know large grain is bad and we got to correct the grain size and we do that through thermocycles and you've probably even seen the picture with the really bad grain somebody did and then the better and better better grain that was apparently accomplished through multiple thermal cycles and then you get down to this really great grain size and that's what you want right that's kind of kind of the standard bit of information that you could tend to see as far as i'm aware but i want to get into it a little bit uh deeper and i'm sure some of you have done some more research so you understand the subject in a little better depth than that but i want to talk about three things specifically first of all what is grain refinement and how does grain refinement happen and then finally how can we control grain size or and or if necessary affect or fix a, a grain size in our project in a piece of steel we're working on so starting out what is grain refinement well that, that has to do with the size of the grain you've got your iron atoms and then if it's steel of course it's got carbon atoms in there, either in between iron atoms, creating a stress, which leads to hardness in the martensitic steel, or it's in there in the form of uh, iron carbides, just kind of in between the lattice work of, of the iron atoms and just kind of sitting there waiting to be used. The iron atoms are able to align in a 3D lattice work in, in a, in a uh, even and orderly fashion. And they're aligned in a particular manner. Once you get to a spot where they no longer align in that same manner, that's where you have a grain boundary. And then you've got another set of atoms that are uh, aligned in a lattice work in a 3D manner. And so you've got, that only goes so far, and then you've got a grain boundary and then you've got another grain and so on and so forth. What we're concerned with ultimately is the, the grain boundary. That's where the weakness lies, not in the actual grain size in the grain itself, where you've got very strong bonds between the at iron atoms in that context. It's where you've got that natural and necessary irregularity between the grain size, or be, or between the grains themselves, you've got that grain boundary. And that's where the uh, a weakness lies and that's what you see for example when you uh, snap a piece of steel apart after quenching and you look at that grain size whether it's large and coarse rough looking or fine velvety and you know very small grain size you're looking at the grain boundaries where they've parted and so in, in a sense so our goal in general is to have a small grain size because we want our material to not to have brittle behavior. So having a smaller grain size, a tougher material leads to obviously overall better toughness of the blade, but also, also very important at the apex of the edge, you want a uh, material that's not going to crumble or shatter or exhibit brittle behavior because that leads to uh, dullness of an edge just as much as having a material that is too soft and will roll over or you know be crushed or um, you know peened over essentially at a microscopic level so again coming back to that sort of trade-off you know having a, a hard blade but something that's not so hard that it's going to exhibit excessive brittle behavior and so one of the ways that we can uh, handle this or some, one of the aspects that we have to pay attention to when it comes to that is the grain size for the reasons we just talked about so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about grain size 
But how does grain refinement actually occur? Well, again, going back to what we said, we're looking for a smaller uh, grain size. And the way we achieve that is to have more grains within the same space. You've got a piece of steel, it's a finite size, and so we want to pack more grains, therefore they have to be smaller into the same space. And the way we do that is by creating new grains and every time we do that we are we are creating more grains because um, we're creating more renucleation or nucleation sites for these new grains and so let's say you've got several grains in this piece of steel within those several grains there's multiple uh, there's more potential nucleation sites than there are grains and so when you heat up a piece of steel you're going to create more grains than you had in the first place and then when you repeat a process like that you're going to create even more because every time you do you've got more nucleation sites than you have grains and therefore the potential to create more grains than you had the last time and so where you go from pearlitic steel for example and you heat it up to austenite you're going to create new grains and then when you um, heat, let it cool from austenite down to pearlite the same thing will happen. That is how new grains are formed. Now there's things that are present in the steel prior to heating up and doing a phase change that affect the ability to create new grains. And we're going to talk about that because there's three specific um, preferential nucleation sites for grains. That is grain boundaries, uh, carbides, and dislocations within the steel. All of these are preferential nucleation sites for new grains when you heat it up to to change into the next a different phase. So grain boundaries is probably the most commonly talked about one and simply when you have two different grains there a, a new grain will typically want to form on that grain boundary. And so if you've got a bunch of different grain boundaries you got a bunch of different areas for new um, grains to form. But that's not the only place that grains like to form. They also like to form on from or around carbides. And so if you have multiple small carbides within this within your steel, that's many, many opportunities for new grains to form. And then the last one you have is dislocations. And that's where there's a dislocation in the atomic structure of the steel or the iron. And that's a naturally occurring feature. I want to study more about it because I don't understand it at the depth that I'd like to. But basically, if you have you know four rows of atoms moving forward or in a 3D dimension, and then suddenly you're missing one, and so it cuts down to three rows, and then it continues on this uh, regular lattice work, and so you've got a space or like a dislocation in there. Another way it can happen is is on like a 3D twisted, so to speak. These dislocations have to do with how we can actually work the steel and they're just a naturally occurring um, feature of, of iron. Instead of just a complete perfect lattice work of iron atoms that would be extremely stable and um, almost impossible to actually do anything with I guess. so. I don't fully understand it quite as well as I want to, but for um, the purpose of this video, I think we can uh, we can talk about it in depth enough. So these dislocations are another nucleation site for uh, new grains. So all these things um, are things we can use to affect and help with uh, grain refinement in our steel. Now the first one, the uh, the grain boundaries, that's sort of not much you have to do with that because uh, that's a naturally occurring very easily. I mean, it just it just it's already there. So, but just to back up, all of these things don't by themselves refine the grain. They are part of the process. They're again, they're nucleation sites for new grains, and so again, to make use of these things, whether it's the grain boundaries or the uh, the carbides or the uh, dislocations, the steel has to be heated up in order for that to actually affect 
new grain growth and therefore grain size. So this is this is still kind of just a skimming the surface here, um, you know, because we could get into these specific things in more in depth, but that, that's kind of beyond the scope of, of what we're doing today. So uh, grain boundaries, they're there. And once you heat the steel up and, you know, and cool it down or vice versa, same thing, then you're creating new grains. And, that, and that's where this whole thermocycle thing comes from. But that's only one of three uh, aspects or potential things for, for grain refinement. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do the video. When you heat the steel up and cool it down, other things are happening as well. And so that's one reason why I used to use a regimen of uh, thermocycles for grain refinement. I don't do that anymore because other things happen when you do that, such as alloy banding, which has to do with carbide segregation in low alloy, high carbon steels. And that in general is not something we want. And so that's sort of a subject even for another video in and of itself. But just to briefly explain why I don't do that anymore. And if you want to do it that way, that's fine. But I'm I want to explain to you the, the issue with that. So let's talk about these other two uh, potentials for uh, grain refinement. So the carbide thing, if we can if we can affect the carbon within our steel in a way that allows it to disperse amongst the the steel in a in a fine array of carbides then that's going to allow for many 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 nucleation sites for new grains upon heating that steel up and just very practically the way that we do this is through a form of annealing when you anneal the steel the or heat it up and cool it down the faster it cools the smaller the grain size first of all is is allowed is going to be the longer that steel is allowed to cool the uh from a high temperature from austenitizing temperature the um larger the grain size has the potential to be and so with a very um I guess you could say aggressive form of annealing, we're not necessarily helping our uh, grain size without additional steps at that point. It might make the steel softer and it, you know relieve stresses in the steel and that's all fine and good. But when it comes to uh, prepping carbides to be nucleation sites for new grain growth, we don't want large grain size if, if possible starting out. And we don't want large carbides, which is also something that slow, heavy annealing allows the steel to do. So what we're looking at is what's known as a, a DET or divorced, eutec divorced eutectoid transformation. And it's a spheridizing type of annealing. And so we're not gonna heat the steel all the way up to austenitizing. We're not gonna completely dissolve everything in the steel but we're going to heat it up to a certain temperature and, and allow it to hold there and allow those carbides to form and then let it cool down slowly. And so this does everything we want it to do. It allows for a dispersion of fine carbides in the steel and uh, helps maintain a smaller grain size without heating things up too much and allowing those grain size grains to grow. Once we've accomplished that, we do have a piece of steel we can easily drill and machine but also we have a steel piece of steel that's ready to be heated up to austenitizing temperature and with all of those fine carbides and a reasonable grain size to start with, um, we have a nice fine grain. Now, there's a lot of other factors that uh, affect this. And uh, I think that's gonna be for another video because this is already getting fairly lengthy. Um, but that's, that's the method that I use particularly now. But let's talk about um, dislocations and this is a really interesting subject to me because you've heard probably a lot about edge packing or cold forging which are not quite the same thing but they're both in the same realm and that is forging steel at a lower temperature than the recommended or standard temperature for forging a piece of steel to actually move the material around. Dislocations in this piece of steel can be created mechanically and so this is where the cold forging that you hear about in some 
bladesmithing traditions, specifically uh, Japanese bladesmithing, and then I, I believe also in the form of traditional bladesmithing when it comes to the edge packing and that kind of thing that people have talked about. I believe that's a form of it also. That's actually creating dislocations in the steel like we talked about earlier. Um, again, they're not doing anything beneficial to the steel right there until you heat it back up and allow that phase change to use those dislocations to create more and therefore finer grains. And so without getting super in depth, uh, cold forging and edge packing um, do, if done properly, have the potential for benefit on the finished product of the, of the steel. But not for the reasons that have often been talked about or, or uh, summarized or hypothesized. I'm going to wrap it up for this video and in the next video I want to talk about on a very practical level when it comes to forging your blade or working with your steel what that looks like but we covered you know uh, what is grain refinement specifically how does it happen and then in the next video we'll get into specifically how we can work with and affect the grain size on a practical level going into heat treating and then during the process of heat treating appreciate you guys watching and we'll see you on the next video